Welcome to Inside the 18. I'm Michael Madge, and with me is ex-MLS goalkeeper Patrick McLean. Hello. And we also have a very special guest with us, LMU goalkeeper coach Mike Asagera. Hello. Mike is also a listener of Inside the 18. Absolutely. So this is pretty awesome to have somebody who's actually a fan of the podcast and is like, you know what? I'm five minutes away. I'm down to come on the show. <laughs> this, is, uh, this, is, this is really cool. Uh, this is honestly the first time we've been doing this with a guest on the air uh, at over at our, our location in here in lovely Santa Monica. So it's a little bit of a new experience for us. Yeah, yeah. yeah can't wait. Excited to have you on, Mike. Yeah. Well, so, thank you. Yeah. As you can tell, Mike's all already rearing to go on the podcast. He's just like, you know what? Uh, I think you guys are going to fill the next hour, and uh, I'll just be here listening <laughs> to you guys because this is what I do regularly. I just listen to the podcast anyway. Um, first off, guys, I want to give a shout-out to everybody who's been rating, reviewing, and subscribing the podcast. You guys have been absolutely phenomenal. We're at 99 reviews in the United States, one more to 100. But what we also found out, Patrick, recently is that – there's all these platforms around the world that we're on that we had yeah. no idea. That's awesome. Yeah. yeah. And apparently there's 111 reviews all over the world that we didn't even know about. And I got to be honest with you, uh, U.S., you're kind of slacking. 99. Yeah, 111, only 99 in the U.S. Guys, just go on to your favorite platform, Apple Podcasts, Twitcher, Stitcher, whatever it's called. <laughs> Twitcher, Stitcher, it's all the same thing. And, uh, and go and rate and review and subscribe. Give that five stars, guys. Remember, we're going to give out an Inside the 18 scarf to somebody once they hit that 100 mark here in the United States. We will also give out one to a, uh, an international. And if you guys can't see the scarves right now, I think Patrick actually might have one behind him right here. Yep. Uh, we'll just show it on camera right here. Uh, this, is, this is terrible. This is not the way to do it. <laughs> here, I'll and, grab an end. All right, why don't you grab an end? And then, Mike, maybe you can grab the other end sure. and I can show you. This is a courtesy of Roughneck Scarves. They are the official scarf provider of Major League Soccer, U.S. Soccer, the NCAA, and now the NHL. So they're pretty big time, but guess who else they sponsor? That's right, Inside the 18. Go to roughneckscarves.com, check them out. You're going to get one of these free scarves if you're one of that lucky people. But we're also going to have them on sale uh, because we're capitalists like that. That's what we do. <laughs> um, guys, so what I want to do first off before we get into the topic today, by the way, guys, if you're checking in, uh, we're going to be talking all about what real college goalkeeper coaches are really looking for from youth goalkeepers. I know a lot of you guys out there get all these different ideas on what you need to put on your tapes. That's why we're like, you know what, we need to get a real Division One goalkeeper coach yep. to give you guys the real deal. Um, so let's first start off with some of these international reviews because I think these are amazing. Uh, this one comes from uh, MRPT86. Uh, which is apparently, I'm guessing he's a computer program. MRT. It's got to be MRPT86, <laughs> or he's uh, a member of like MI6 or something like that. Like, it's a good chance he's just a, a s special uh, spy of some sort. And he goes, fairly new listener, was surprised to hear goalkeeping being spoken about in so much depth with some new technical terms I'd known about, but the action, but not had heard it labeled that way. Maybe down to the American slash English differences. That's right. They probably don't use the Cobra technique <laughs> in Great Britain. And also broken down so much. Really enjoying the few I've listened to so far. Keep it up, dudes. I think that was him uh, trying yeah. to take a shot at the, uh, the American accent Especially type Especially the, the California way. <laughs> yeah, that's right. We're stoked to be on here, guys. Let's We're, go, dudes. Let's do it. Uh, five stars. Uh, thanks, MRPT86. All right, this next one. Uh, now we're going uh, down under. <laughs> I'm never going to do that again. Down <laughs> under. Great to have so many experienced goalkeepers <laughs> give their opinions. Uh, this guy just on. stopped listening. Yeah, Sorry, bud. <laughs> <laughs> this is Nick D1307. <laughs> and Nick D1307 goes, great to have so many experienced goalkeepers give their opinions and views on easily accessible podcasts. That's, That's great. That's right, guys. We're available on every single platform out there. You know why? Because I went on a list and I looked at every accessible platform out there and said, hey, put Inside the 18 on there. And they said, we don't know what that is. And I go, it's a goalkeeping podcast. They're like, okay, so you're one of the three ones out there. Cool, we'll do that. So uh, thanks. Shout out again to Nick D1307 on that. Uh, all right, and uh, then this last one right here, this one goes, brilliant detail and understanding on goalkeeping. Just gets better and better each episode. I'm from Ireland, and I will not do, no, you know, my no. I will do the Irish accents. Uh, this yeah. podcast informs me about the MLS. The podcast isn't too serious with Mike. Breaking we're the old we're joke successfully there, offending right? everyone. <laughs> everyone. That's what we're trying to do, guys. We are work woke culture here. Because uh, we're American. Yeah. 
That's this what we American do. That's, that's how Americans do it. Uh, no, this just has kidding. really helped develop my knowledge as a goalkeeper. Thank you all. And then he's got those hands doing that thing. Um, I don't know what that means exactly. It's. I mean, you could take it a lot of ways if yeah. you're. This is yeah. a goalkeeping podcast. Yeah. So, so that's, maybe that's that's the W shape, the yeah. contour shape, catching the ball. Yeah. Maybe that's what that is. And uh, that's from uh, Obi Nwowi. I'm totally butchering your name, dude. I'm sorry, uh, Obi. Yeah. We're just gonna we're just gonna have you be Obi and Obi. You, you're gonna have to like like come on the show someday just to uh, to tell us straight up uh, how to say that properly. Yeah, that's that's awesome. And and we uh, we promise we'll only try your accents once yeah <laughs> or i might try it seven times yeah but, but yeah still. actually that's that's a fake promise yeah <laughs> uh i also want to give a quick shout out to aaron curtis uh recently uh an insider who listened to the podcast had no idea that we had answered his question uh, about a month ago <laughs> and he goes uh his goalkeeper coach adrian conan mentioned it to me and i was like what ha ha i am feeling so much better in myself and more confident lately four games three wins two clean sheets and one loss. It really started to show, and I'm reaping the rewards on the confidence. So thanks for answering that question. Uh, I'm going to give that all to Patrick, to be honest. Hey, with man, you. that's great. That's exactly why we're, we're doing what we're doing is to, to help as many people is in as many ways as we can. And, uh, you know, that's what that's really what we're about. Like we say it every time, iron, iron sharpens iron. That's that's what we're here to do. Yeah. I mean, because we are really just goalkeepers. And when it comes down to it, goalkeepers are about helping the goalkeeping community. That whole, I know cheesy, we say it all the time, hashtag GK Union. That's why Mike's here. I actually met Mike at a, at a college goalkeeper camp years ago, and, uh, and that's how everything becomes full circle. You know, and look at, look at the six degrees of separation right here, and Patrick says, oh, you know, we should have Mike on. I'm like, I know Mike. I saw Mike do some amazing, amazing tip-over saves in <laughs> demos, and I was like, we definitely have to get that guy. Um, so let's get into one of these uh, listener questions real quick. Uh, this one comes from David Lasher. Uh, from North Carolina, and he goes, love these podcasts. I have a U11 son who loves Keeper. He's played since U8, barely highly sought after and advanced for his age. Since lots, of, well, that's kind of a humble brag right there. Uh, so, <laughs> I mean, he's not he's not bragging for himself. It's on behalf of his kids. That's true. So I, that's I, I true. totally understand. That. Okay, no, that's <laughs> true. I don't have children, uh, and if I did, I'd probably be very proud of them as well. Actually, I would probably wouldn't be proud of them because I'd probably be like, no, that collapse dive is awful. <laughs> need to put some work in. I'm that <laughs> terrible parent that you don't want to have out there. Um, since lots of kids are still moved around in goal, we play 9v9 and he plays up two ages at 11v11 also. Do you feel this will hinder his development or keep him advanced with the larger field and keep him moving ahead of other keepers? Just a reference, he's 10 years old and wears a size 8 men's shoe. Wow. Jeez, big kid. Yeah, he's got he's got apparently Kevin Durant <laughs> playing in goal there, uh, and uh, he's discouraged when the other team scores above his fingertips. He doesn't get discouraged about that. His nine v nine team is really good, but the eleven v eleven team is at a lower level than others, so he gets lots of shots in games. Thanks for any feedback. Uh, let's open this up to uh, the people that actually know goalkeeping outside of me. Uh, Mike, do you want to start this one? Yeah, sure. I mean. Yeah, I think that at that age, as many games as you can get at any level is the most important thing. You know, if your son is getting the opportunity to get different looks uh, with different teams at different levels, you know, it's all good experience. And I think he's going to benefit from that uh, as a as a young man. Patrick. Yeah, I I, uh, I couldn't agree more. I think. Also, I mean, playing up a level, that's so, I think that's so beneficial because you're forcing yourself into a, an uncomfortable situation. And we talk about this every week. You should not be comfortable when it comes to goalkeeping. The, the more uncomfortable you are, and yeah, it's going to be discouraging. It's great that, um, that this individual doesn't get discouraged. I think that's going to help you a lot. Uh, but just to put yourself in those situations and, and, and make yourself uncomfortable and try to get better. Yeah. Uh, I mean, what if I just completely disagreed with both of you guys? And Go I was like, no, it. actually, this is a terrible <laughs> idea. Uh, this kid uh, should not be doing that. He should be playing U6s. Uh, I, I, that's what I think would be great. And Jen, he could just dominate. And then the parent could be like, he's the best U6 in the world. Yeah. And then it'd be like, he's actually 10. And they're like, oh, never mind. <laughs> just, just fake birth certificates yeah, just is fake what birth we're saying. Fake birth certificates is what we're trying to say. Uh, <laughs> get into those FIFA youth tournaments. Um, no. In all honesty, uh, I actually, you know, uh, reached out to David afterwards because I thought it was a really good question, and I said he's getting the best of both worlds here. You know, he's obviously totally. playing with his age group still, so they sound like they're a pretty high-level team, so the speed of play is very good. Um, he's also getting that experience of playing on the big field, 
And look, even a professionals play in small dimension fields to work on, you know, uh, escape and, you know, less time, you know, uh, to be able to make decisions and all that sort of things. So he should be able to deal with that dimension. And eventually he's going to play on that big field anyway. Yeah. So he might as well start getting totally. used to it. Um, also bigger ball. Yeah. You know, so yeah. now he's 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 making that thing back and forth between the two. I like the fact that the kid doesn't get discouraged when the ball uh, gets above his fingertips. Uh, I get discouraged. <laughs> yeah, same. <laughs> when yeah. the ball uh, gets above my fingertips because everyone looks at me and they go, this is why we didn't want you playing in goal. We wanted the six three dude playing in goal, so that oh, doesn't happen. Um, honestly, at that age, it's about getting reps, right? Right. And the more reps he can get, the more experiences he can get, the more he can draw from as he becomes a better goalkeeper. I Go totally ahead. like this format too, because not only are you getting in a situation where you're uncomfortable, but you're also getting in a situation where you have success with your team at your age group, and you're and you're getting both sides of the coin because otherwise. I mean, you're just getting one. It's exactly what Mike was saying earlier. Like, it's so important to have different looks. And this is a pretty good format as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, I mean, actually, this is – I feel like this should be almost something that a lot of clubs should be looking at yeah. is, is uh, when they have a higher-level goalkeeper at the, at the younger, you know, space uh, age – to uh, move them onto a, a bigger field and, and have them get that opportunity as well, too. Um, so, David, I, I hope that answers your question right there. Remember, guys, if you have a listener question, contact at insidethe18media.com, or you can DM us at, at Goalkeeper Podcast or set at Goalkeeper Pod on Twitter. Unfortunately, we can't do podcast on Twitter. I don't know why that is. I think somebody it's somebody stole it. Yeah. So <laughs> did somebody take, if somebody took Goalkeeper Podcast, do we have to like buy it from them? That's probably what they're doing. Yeah. They're just <laughs> waiting for us to like price gouge. <laughs> no, I, I think, um, I think, I think we've answered this right here, but speaking of, of this and, you know, scouting at the younger ages and putting yourself in a position to become a better goalkeeper, I kind of want to lead into today's topic uh, through this. This is the worst segue I've ever done in my life. I don't know how a 10 year old can, uh, go to college, but hey, maybe <laughs> against NCAA rules, maybe people are looking at 10-year-olds. Uh, hopefully not. Well, luckily, he'll grow up. <laughs> he will grow up. He, do, he will grow up, and at some point, he'll be looking at colleges. Um, but today's topic, and this is kind of a, kind of a follow-up on the one that we did with Sean Phillips and Doug Cardozzi uh, this summer um, over at Camp Shutout in regards to you know college applications and getting scouted by colleges and all that sort of stuff. Uh, is with that's why we had Mike here is it's what do college goalkeeper coaches really look for we kind of got the head coach's opinion when we had Sean Phillips on and we had Doug Cardozzi as a youth goalkeeper coach you know trying to give some advice there but now you know there's a lot of information out there Mike that that I think you hear all the time and you're like you know I think you're being give, given bad advice or I think you might be giving good advice so let's just start at it right here what in your opinion is a college level goalkeeper you know I think there can be a ton of different answers to that question, but for me and I think for a lot of goalkeeper coaches, you want to look for young people that are looking for the environment to challenge themselves. You know, um, going into a, a college environment is, is a difficult situation for young people, and you have to be willing to accept challenges and push yourself, like Patrick says, being uncomfortable because you're going to go into – a new environment with a new coach and new teammates and if you're not willing to kind of push yourself and accept that challenge it's going to be very difficult for you so you want to meet these young people and kind of get to know them and be like hey this is a person that is going to have a good attitude and they're going to want to learn every day you know that that a student mentality that I've heard you guys talk about before is probably the most important thing is someone who is willing to accept criticism but it hopefully it's you know constructive criticism yeah and i think patrick was bringing up a really good point in regards to you know having that mentality that mindset and patrick do you feel you know obviously you went through the recruiting process you know uh at a very high level to play at a division one and all that sort of thing do you feel that the, your mindset and your work ethic is what really attracted college coaches to you yeah i think uh, especially in my my situation i think that was probably the biggest selling factor because i was such an unknown when i was going through this process so i really had to um, navigate through a lot of it myself um, so having those attributes and you know knowing what i wanted out of soccer you know out of life etc having those goals i think is something that really helped uh, in the recruiting process as well. You know, there's so many there's so many kids that are just like, oh yeah, I'm, I want to be a pro, and and 
you really got to have specific achievable goals so you don't get discouraged. I think that's so important. Yeah, and I think that's that's a really good thing that you're bringing up in regards to achievable goals. By the way, guys, I'm gonna stand up a little bit higher because I feel <laughs> really short. I was like slouching in that chair, and like everyone's like, "Oh, he is really short. He's like four nine. It's like, no, <laughs> he's not four nine. He's just oh, slouching he's an elf. in the chair. He's an elf. He's the smallest <laughs> goalkeeper of all time. Um, no, uh, getting back to it, you were talking about um, mindset. Obviously, physical attributes are important. But I think, Mike, I think you would agree with this, that if you have a goalkeeper who might not have the physical attributes from a prototypical standpoint, um, but they have the mindset, the discipline, and you can see how they can get past those limitations to play at the collegiate level, you're more apt to scout and recruit that goalkeeper. Oh, 100%. Um, I think the most important thing is the, men the men mental approach that's taken to not only the game itself, but to your off the field um, diet, uh, exercise, sleep, um, academics, all of those things go into making a well-rounded goalkeeper at the college level. You know, and to go back to what Patrick was saying about his mentality, I, when I first met Patrick, he was still in college and he was playing on a summer team that I coached. And the first thing that I recognized about him was his mental approach to the game. I mean, he was laser focused, locked in, every time we trained, every time we went to the came to the games, and I'm like, man, this guy has that aspect taken care of to make it to the next level. Yeah, and I, I mean, honestly, I saw that even as a youth goalkeeper when I first saw Patrick when he was getting ready to go to college and he was getting scouted by different schools and stuff like that. I'd, I'd never seen anybody who had come from such a, for lack of a better term, independent <laughs> background. <laughs> and let's just get, let's say, you'd, you know, you'd been a little bit behind from a technical for and sure. tactical standpoint. Um, but you were willing to put the work in to catch up and then surpass everybody else. And, and I think a lot of times, a lot of young goalkeepers, they come up to me, and, and I even had this question come up to me today, is that how old is too old? Um, and I, I honestly, I don't think there isn't a too old. I think if you want to put the work in and, and you're willing to, to showcase that you can catch up, it's going to be a lot more difficult for you. Uh, but anything's possible if you have that right mindset. Um, I was a little concerned when Mike said about the sleep pattern because I was worried that on LMU scouting trips they, they watch players sleep <laughs> to see if they have the right <laughs> sleep patterns um, before they choose to go. Um, no, let's talk about the scouting process uh, at the Division One level sure. and goalkeeper coach from a goalkeeper coach's point of view. It's obviously going to be a little bit different than the team coach's point of view when they're scouting and they're like, eh, that guy's 6'7", let's take that dude. Uh, <laughs> you know, you're going to be looking at it from a more uh, – let's just say uh, elite eye. So explain kind of that scouting process. So the process basically starts with identification first. You know, we'll go up to a showcase or a tournament or an individual game. And what I like to do is I like to see first and foremost how you interact with your teammates. You know, the goalkeeper is kind of the most important part of the team from the back to the front. And how do you communicate with them? What kind of advice are you giving them? What kind of positivity is permeating through the team? Um, a lot of times elite goalkeepers are playing on very good teams and you don't see the ball too much. So how are you affecting your team in a positive way? You know, when your teammates make a mistake, what's the first thing you say to them? You know, are you lifting them up? And when you make a big save, how is your, what's your reaction? You know, what's basically your role within the team? And that's how I can see how you as an individual are going to translate into a college program because it's not just a team it's an entire program and there's so many things that go into it you're not just a soccer player anymore you represent so many more things that are bigger than yourself and that becomes a huge part of why and how we recruit you dude i love the fact that he yeah. just brought up about when you're watching them, that you're watching everything off the ball. Yes. Because a lot of goalkeepers, they get scared at showcases or when, when they know college scouts are around. Um, I see this at DA showcases all the oh, time. Yeah. And it's like they try to overdo it mm -hmm. when they know a scout's totally, there as totally. opposed to playing their game. Exactly. And and that's that's when you make mistakes because, totally. you know, are you is that how you're going to be in a regular day-to-day -day environment with Mike, you know? You don't want to see that. You want to see how you really work with your team. Exactly. You know, so that's why you guys always try to lurk in the shadows. So that a the, little bit. The, <laughs> the kids don't know that you're there. Um, they know. And so that guy's not trying to do this like, I've seen, oh my gosh, I, I, 
I've seen this. I've seen this at trial so many times. Guys going for these amazing tip over saves when they could have just gotten clean hands. Yeah. yeah. And you're like, that's not going to impress you. And I mean, uh, uh, advice to young goalkeepers everywhere the cleaner and easier you can make things look with positioning and just, you know, like he said, just doing the what I call the 85% really well. You know, that 15% where you're making that upper 90 save or you're making that 1v1 save, like that is what's going to separate you from other goalkeepers. But the foundation of a good goalkeeper is that 85% and making things look clean and easy and efficient. And that is the first thing that I look for is, you know, can you do all of the foundational things well? And then I'll start looking at, you know, the next 15 percent, you know, that elite stuff, because when you get into college, you want goalkeepers that are as mistake free as possible. And then it's going to become that next stuff that kind of pushes them into a starters role, you know, that we're they're not going to. You know, most goalkeepers in college aren't going to lose you soccer games, but you want to find that one that's going to win you a game, that's going to make that save, that turns the tide of a game and lifts the team. And all of a sudden you're like, wow, we should have got scored there. But this goalkeeper made such a great save that the team now has momentum going forward. So I, I want to bring this back to Patrick here, and I want to bring about the fact that when you went on professional trials, you know, going to MLS trials and that, that sort of thing, you know, coming from a later background, coming from an un undrafted background, you know, how did you showcase yourself in that aspect? Did you show that you were clean and that you did all the basics right and that you had the right mentality to be a pro more so because everybody at the pro level can make that top hand save. Yeah, totally. Um, and to answer your question, yeah, that was, that was a pretty grueling process. And actually Mike knows all about it. Mike and I were actually living at living together at the time. So he, uh, he got to experience this in the, in the day to day, but man, I can't tell you how, how much focus you need to have in a situation like that, especially when you're jumping up a level is just they want to see that not only do you have the potential to earn a roster spot, but they want to see that you have the potential to at some time take over the reins and be, be a starting goalkeeper. Um, so, I mean, specifically, if I was showing, I think what I really tried to show is my personal, like, physical attributes, um, you know, my athleticism, and my work ethic, like, those things uh, were were what really I think set me apart, um, and just the ability to to lock into whatever I was doing and and, and just showcase that as best as I could. I think it was also your hair. I think <laughs> your hair helped out with that too. They're like that guy looks like a pro. Yeah, I buzzed my head at the time. <laughs> Did you really? <laughs> yeah, you buzzed your hair. Yeah, I used to do that intermittently. <laughs> <laughs> um, I want to talk a little bit about how goalkeepers should present themselves to college coaches. Because, again, I see so many mistakes in this, in this regard, and especially with goalkeeper coaches. Because, again, I can't stress this enough to you, everybody listening out there. The way you present yourself to a goalkeeper coach is you're presenting yourself to another member of the goalkeeper union that knows what he or she is doing, you know? Um, it's not like you're – because I see this a lot of times. It's like they're like, well, you know, in goalkeeping, it's like, yeah, I know, I'm a goalkeeper. Like, <laughs> they're so used to talking to coaches yeah. that don't know anything about goalkeeping. So – what are some of the do's and don'ts in your opinion? I think first and foremost, you have to be confident yet humble. And I think that's something that you'll find in the best goalkeepers is there is that confidence that they exude, but at the same time when they speak about themselves or other goalkeepers, there's you know a ton of humility that comes forward. And as a young person, man or woman, when you meet a goalkeeper coach, just be yourself. You know, And that's the most important thing is be yourself, be open, um, you know, most goalkeepers have a pretty good sense of humor, I feel like, and like to laugh together. So a joke or two here and there, I mean, I like to try to, you know, lighten the mood a bit because I understand how stressful the situation can be, especially for a young goalkeeper meeting a coach of a school that they really want to go to. And you have to understand, we're just people who play the same position. So we understand the day in and day out grind of it all. And it's stressful. So the last thing I want to do is add more stress to your life. If anything, I'm trying to take it away. I'm trying to help you you know, de-stress. So understand that when you do meet a goalkeeper coach, be yourself, you know, talk with just com comfortability of you, who you are and the position, and you, you will shine through eventually when you get kind of past that nervousness. Um, I just want to comment on that because Mike is, Mike really sets himself apart as being one of the best at doing this. And, and we all know that being a goalkeeper can be very stressful. <laughs> 
and Mike is Mike is always out there cracking jokes. When it's time to work, he works. I mean, he works really hard. We've worked together a lot, so I can say that. And I mean, just just his ability to like keep things keep things light and keep your head in the right place is uh, is really special. And uh, hopefully, uh, you know, he's at some point looking to to get to the next level with that as well. So. Uh, <laughs> I don't want to put you on blast for no, LMU. No, no, I, I feel that. like I'm doing an infomercial for yeah. LMU soccer uh, <laughs> right here. I don't want to. I don't want to. Yeah, I'm trying to tiptoe of all the NCAA regulations. I don't want to. <laughs> I don't want to do anything that uh, that's considered uh, off kilt. I think uh, uh, that's that's something that's kind of lost on a lot of goalkeeper coaches is is that ability to to lighten things because so many goalkeepers, you know, they have such we're such unique creatures and we're, we're, we're all our own in individuals and some guys are just really heavy and like, that's all they do is it's just really heavy. It's really, uh, constructional and there's no lighter side. And I think that's really important when you're talking about the balance as it applies to say a full season, because these, there's gotta be that balance between, man, this is super heavy. My coach, my coach is yelling at me for a ball I played like, you got all these things that are weighing on your shoulders and to have somebody who has the ability to take away some of that pressure with a joke or with whatever it is like that is invaluable. I can't, I can't tell you enough. See, I just like to hit side volleys from like with inside the six yard box and just <laughs> hammer them left and right until the goalkeeper just hates themselves. And Get up. Like, I don't, don't want to do this anymore. No, I, I, you know, honestly, I used to take it as kind of a, I don't want to say an insult, but whenever people would say like, Oh my gosh, your sessions are so much fun, and um, I see my my son or daughter always laughing and stuff like that, and that that uh, that that's so great. And I would always be like, "Well, I'm a real goalkeeper coach. And I know what I'm talking about, and I'm not a clown and everything." And now I've started realizing the more and more I've done it uh, over the years and stuff like that is that I feel like, and I'm not trying to be bragging about myself, but I feel like just in general, goalkeeper coaches who have that balance between the, the, the work hard, but enjoy the experience too. And I told this to a goalkeeper yesterday. I said, you have to enjoy the experience. Yep. This private session at 5.30 on a Monday, you have to enjoy this the same that you do that Saturday morning game with your club team, you know? And if you don't, then then there's the mindset's not going to be there and you're not going to get the most out of the session. Yeah, you, you got to enjoy it as much, if not more. Yeah. I mean, honestly. Yeah, I love training sessions because that's where I shine because in games, <laughs> I'm mostly, usually sitting on a bench. So like, I mean, I mean, it's true. It's like, I, I, I always tell the story this of like <laughs> playing, going to USL, uh, a preseason USL and my sister goes to come and watch with her, her boyfriend at the time and uh, they're like going to be 10 minutes late to the game. And my sister goes, we can't be late. It's like, she's like, well, we're just going to miss warm. She's like, no, that's when my brother plays. <laughs> he plays at the warm-ups. So I, I, I spent, I, I enjoy getting a jersey. Um, all right, let's talk about uh, what you should do at an ID camp, okay? Because this, I see a lot of mistakes here. We were talking about already trying to do too much. We're talking about that nervous energy mm -hmm. of being scared to talk to the goalkeeper coach. Uh, then we have the other people who try to overcompensate and try to come across as their more big time than the goalkeeper coach because they're insecure and they think that that's what the goalkeeper coach is going to want to see. We have the people who try to be David De Gea and do a spread <laughs> save on everything because they think that's modern goalkeeping. We have the dude Oof. who thinks he's Allison Becker and literally tries to just chip balls <laughs> over everybody. Uh, Mike, you just did an ID camp uh, this summer. Uh, why, why don't you explain the situation? Well, you know, the biggest thing for me in an ID camp is, I hate to harp on this again, but it's to be yourself. Like, what do you bring different than other goalkeepers? You know, like you said, do you have attributes that you're very good at and then attributes that maybe you're not so good at but that you're willing to work at? And that's where the relationship with the player and the coach grows is can a player be self I guess, b be able to self-identify their weaknesses and ask those questions to the goalkeeper coach. Like, hey, I'm not great with my feet. Like, what can I do to get better with my feet? You know, and that's just one example when there's a plethora of them. But at an ID camp, like you said, you can't be just like, oh, I'm great. It's a, it, I'm doing you a favor by being here. It's more <laughs> of I'm going to do my best and then please be brutally honest on what I can be better at because I want to come to your school or I want to play at this level. 
how how great are the kids that come up to you and they're like you they're like talking to the other goalkeepers they're like yeah man I'm also being looked at by and you're like oh, <laughs> <"Shut> <laughs> off. that happens cares. more often than you would think and it's like and you're like you're like I thought you won't like do you think they're going to be interested in you more because you're talking about all these schools that sent you a, uh, I don't know, chain letter? Well, I had a, it's so funny you say that. I had a kid come up to me in an ID, ca- ID camp relatively recently and say, oh, I was going to go to this other school's ID camp, but it would be easier to make your team, so I came here. <laughs> <laughs> and I looked at him, and I was like, do you realize what you just said? Uh, okay, I mean, nice to meet you. Like, let's That's when you start you hitting those side volleys <laughs> in the six-yard box, right? I might have tried to put a couple more top corner on him, you know, just to prove a point. But, uh, you know, like I said before, like, when you go to those camps, just be yourself. Work as hard as you can. Be humble, and you'll – your attributes will shine through. And if you do feel like maybe you finished the ID camp and you're like, hey, I didn't do that well, um, come back or go to uh, another one where that goalkeeper coach is going to be at because all the goalkeeper coaches know each other. We go to each other's camps. We go to different camps. And I see the same goalkeeper sometimes three or four times. And maybe the first time I see him, I think, I'm not sure. And then as I get to know them more, I'm like, wait a second. There is something there that I would – probably take that kid on and in a couple years he'll be ready to go yeah I, w- I want to talk about that real quick in regards to we all know each other because when you're showing that kid that with the arrogant attitude you're going to tell all those other coaches 100 percent. hey dude <laughs> uh at you know so and so university uh we just had this kid show up at the id camp and he was saying how you're so interested in him and how you know he can't you know he'd rather play there than here and everything like that and we just want to let you know that's what you're walking into yeah. and they'll be like ooh we, we don't want that we all talk we and all sometimes talk. that backfires because yeah. i'll say hey what about this kid and they're like i've never heard of that kid oh yeah and so the kid is just name dropping maybe in a not truthful way so you have to be like i said just just be yourself be truthful be kind of a stand-up you know guy or girl and you're gonna find a place because We've seen so many different goalkeepers, and we've been through it so much. We see through that stuff really quickly. I mean, I, I even see this, I, I, you know, and I want to give this to youth parents out there, you know, who are listening, and I'll hear them on the sidelines. And so it's like, you know, um, yeah, well, my son got a letter from UCLA. I'm like, oh, you know that UCLA sent that letter to every DA goalkeeper in Southern California, <laughs> right? Uh, that's just uh, just because they're just they're looking, you know, and I'm not, not putting UCLA on blast. I'm just using UCLA as a university example. Oh, my gosh, man, I am going to. I'm going to end up never uh, being able to talk to UCLA after that. <laughs> uh, no, I'm just using no, it I mean, as an example. That's, that's 100% true. Yeah. I mean, you <laughs> that that just never changes. Like every level, there's always going to be those people. Um, but the best advice that I can give is is just don't be that guy or a girl. Uh, just, just do your work. Like Mike said, be a stand-up person. Be a good person. Be somebody who wants to learn. Because those are the things that are actually going to get you noticed and actually going to get you a spot on the team and probably are going to get you further than that mm-hmm. if you do those things well. So let's let's get into recruiting tapes now. Um, this is also a topic that we discussed with Sean Phillips and, and with Doug Cardozi in regards to putting a proper recruiting tape together. And uh, I still see a lot of bad tapes out there. Cool. And I and cool. you know you, you get the you get the people in an indoor racquetball court, you know, diving into mats, hey. and you're like, you know, <laughs> that was Patrick's hey. whole recruiting no, tape. He's like, no, he's like, actually, he's like, I just started playing soccer last week, so <laughs> I don't know what I'm doing. Uh, and they're like, look at that athlete, bring him in anyway. <laughs> he just wrestled a bear. Uh, <laughs> but uh, but let's talk about what what do you want to see on a recruiting tape? You um, know? So. For me, um, we get so many tapes and so many videos. Uh, in all honesty, sh- in the first 30 seconds to a minute of the tape, showcase yourself uh, as best you can. R- like, reel us in. You know, I kind of think of it maybe from a stand-up uh, comedian's point of view is you want to th- drop a couple jokes. Dude, that'd, that'd be get- great if somebody honestly on the recruiting tape took that literally and they just started doing like bits. <laughs> oh, dude, I would, I, like, I'm kind of, like, as a goalkeeper, it's like, we're not the most normal people, so, like, I'm kind of a weird guy when it comes to that. If somebody did that, I that would probably would, watch the whole hilarious. tape. And, like, <laughs> this guy deserves a full view of his film. You're gonna get just 40 tapes. <laughs> <and> just <laughs> <laughs> After this goes out to the thousands of people that listen. By the way, guys, 99 reviews in the United States. There are thousands of people that listen to this podcast in the United States. How are you only doing 99 reviews? You all should be ashamed of yourselves. Anyway, <laughs> back to you, Mike. Um, I mean, if, if you have an ability that you feel like sets yourself apart from other goalkeepers, 
showcase that immediately. If I click on your video and the first thing is of you doing something very well, I'm probably gonna keep watching. You know, some people like to compartmentalize their videos in footwork and crosses and building out of the back. You know, if the first minute of you is just 10 yard passes to your center backs, snooze fest, I'm probably not gonna watch. <laughs> you know, but if it's you making a fantastic save or outletting the ball with a side volley 50 yards on a dime, I'm like, hey, I'm gonna watch this. But you, you know? know why that was put on there? Because some coach told them totally. that's what they want totally. to see. Yeah. Ten yard passes, you know, back and forth, making sure that you have can clean be feet. later in the tape, you know, yeah. where you reel us in with some good stuff, and then you're like, okay, now it's me outletting. Now it's me taking clean crosses and distributing. Those things are important, a hundred percent. But we're humans. We want to see something that is going to catch our eye and catch our interest because, at some point, I'm going to have to show that video to the head coach and say, like, hey, I might have to go fly to Texas to watch this kid play watch this video and if he watches the first 30 seconds goes yep sure here's the money to go to go watch that kid um that's the difference maybe between you getting recruited and not getting recruited i also think it's really important and and tell me if i'm wrong mike is that make sure that you're showcasing the striker on tape how many times do you get tapes where you're like i don't really know what the speed of play was yeah. there because yeah. i i you could have literally just had a friend throw the ball to you totally <laughs> yeah you know, and, and also as far as training videos con are concerned, I mean, for the most part, we like to see game film. But if you do do a training film, do a separate one. Um, if you have, you can send two links to YouTube, right? Send a game film and a training film. And if I see what I like in the game film, I will watch the training film and see what kind of training you do, what the level is. Um, some guys, like you said before, will go to a park and be jumping over trash cans. And... That That's Patrick's really, tape. That's you know, Patrick. <laughs> that <laughs> Patrick somersaulted, <laughs> and then yeah. he did Superman <laughs> over trash cans. Jumping over trash cans, <laughs> wrestling bears. Yeah. That's, that was my recruiting trip. You know what's funny is when Patrick and I used to train, there would be times I'd be like, hey, Patrick, you know, what are you feeling for training today? And he would go around the field and collect certain items, like a trash can or a hurdle or a giant box. And he's like, we're using this today. And you're like, okay, man, like, let's use the giant box today. Not you know? sure how this is going to work yet, but... Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Patrick should put together like a construction zone goalkeeper <laughs> video. If I had a construction zone next to my training field, uh, we would be golden. It's absolutely <laughs> amazing. He's just cr like taking traffic cones from the road and like throw like totally. tossing them. I've done that. There's I've done that. We've used more traffic cones than I would like to admit. I'm not gonna lie. <laughs> um, okay. Let's. Uh, uh, sorry, I have one. Ahead. I have one question yeah, for yeah. Mike. How many of these videos do you get like daily, weekly, through the course of your season? How, how many are you typically getting just to just to show you how important it is that you're using things that are setting your, yourself apart? Yeah, I mean, uh, on a daily basis, probably five to ten um, on a weekly basis, you know, do the math 50 and then on a monthly basis, you know, closer to 100. Um, it just depends. You know, we get we get videos from all around the world now. We get uh, sports agencies that are trying to help young men and women um, from Europe, from Africa, from South America, from Asia, and then you get the domestic ones. So we watch them all. I frankly, I watch every single one. And like I said, sometimes it's 30 seconds to a minute, um, but you know, y you never know where your next great goalkeeper is gonna come from. So it's my job to make sure that I watch them all. So if you're a young man or woman who's out there and wants to play at that level, you know, a, a video is an important tool to get you seen maybe in a school that can't come watch you play, that you really is your dream school. You know, Patrick was from Eau Claire, Wisconsin, you know, and he was able to go to California because he made himself visible. And that's the most important thing is exposure. And guys, now it's, it's easier than ever to get these videos. Like you have, every one of us has like an iPhone or whatever, and we have this ability yeah, to- Yeah, look, we, even we can film ourselves. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> that should show you something. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, the, it's it's easier to access uh, accessibility for this stuff than ever. Like I can't tell you how much of a headache it was putting together a highlight tape when I was going through the process. But that was twelve, you know, twelve plus years ago. I don't want to age myself too much here. But you had to do it on like celluloid film, it, right? It was <laughs> like brutal. Cut, it, cut the film, like actually. Luckily, I had like the best editor in the world. Otherwise, this would not have worked out. Um, but just, it's so, it's so easy to get this stuff together. It's so easy to get footage, like have your parents just turn on a videotape when the, uh, when the action's coming close to you, like 
that's that stuff's important and now it's easier than ever like and it can be so valuable for you yeah um let's let's move away from the, the videotape right now because i feel like we're kind of you know um getting redundant there um, but let's talk about college projects, okay? And what I mean by college projects, I don't mean like independent projects <laughs> from an independent study standpoint. I mean as in like a goalkeeper that might not be ready to play it at your school, um, but you see something in them. Totally. And a lot of times I get a lot of kids and they say, do these schools actually take projects into consideration or do you have to be the, the real deal coming into the school? And I always say it's on a case-by-case -case basis. If you're six seven and you're a great athlete, and you can't catch a cold right now, they might still take a <laughs> chance on you because they, they think they can train that into you. 100% um, projects are a part of the college game. Um, every, I feel like, and this is in my opinion, every good goalkeeping core in the country will have a project because the potential being seen by that coach is probably two and three years down the line. You know, you have a couple older guys that are probably playing. Um, and then some younger guys coming through the ranks who shouldn't be finished products, you know, because that's just kind of how it goes in uh, your goalkeeping core. So, yeah, you know, no goalkeeper that is probably playing in college is an actual finished product. Maybe as a senior, you know, that's getting ready to go pro, you're a finished product. But as a freshman, you're coming in with deficiencies. And so it's the goalkeeper coach's job to help you get better at those. And all the time, I'll watch guys and I'll say, like, hey, he's, he's kind of weak in these areas, but, man, he's got that potential to be a big-time goalie in a few years. And absolutely, you know, lots of coaches will see guys and coaches see the game differently, and they'll say, hey, I want that guy because I want to work with him or that girl, and I want to work with him and make them better. Is that a hard convincing to a head coach? At times, um, it depends. Like you said, if they're six seven and they can't catch a cold, it's probably an easier conversation. Mm -hmm. But um, how about if they're five nine and can't catch a cold? Is that a? It just <laughs> depends. <laughs> if you, there could be a five nine goalkeeper feel whose feet are amazing. <laughs> yeah. And you're saying, hey, I can develop them into a good goalkeeper. But look at those feet. This guy can build out of the back. And you know the game now, the modern game. It starts with the goalkeeper. And so it's actually more of a detriment if you have bad feet, and we have to work on those. But Everything can be learned. Everything can be taught if you have the right attitude. And yeah, absolutely, we'll take on guys that are girls that maybe aren't a finished product, but we're like, it, the potential is there. And yeah. that's our job is to see the potential in everyone. Yeah. Patrick, I know you were considered a project. I was definitely a project. <laughs> <laughs> As a project, I can tell you that they, they, they take chances on projects occasionally. And I can't tell you how many no's I got before. Cal Poly and a few others were like, yeah, yeah, let's see, let's see where this goes. And uh, I'll, one thing that a lot of people don't know is I went to school, I went to Cal Poly as a recruited walk-on. I didn't have scholarship money. Like I was paying out of pocket my first year and it was just, it was as much of a project as it gets. Like, let's see how you do kiddo. <laughs> and uh, you know, fortunately, I always had the mentality that I was a project and even going into my, my professional career, like I still considered myself a project because I don't think there's a lot of finished products out there. And I, and I have yet to see a goalkeeper who can't improve something. So yeah, take that for what it's worth. <laughs> that, that right there shows a lot right there. You could be a project going to college and then end up playing a major league soccer guys. I mean, any, totally. any, that's that's the type of mindset that you need to and it has to come internally guys you can't ask the coach to bring it out from you that's got to come from inside that that inner confidence you know I always tell people you know and I was, I was telling the story yesterday to a kid is that you know the second that I don't have confidence on the field is the second I'm getting scored on left and right yeah because the team can sense that yeah the second that I feel confident I might not be the biggest goalkeeper in the world but the but if I'm confident out on that field the other team believes that I know what I'm doing, even if it's not the case. And, and they're, 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 well, they're like, well, we have to place it on the post. Otherwise, this guy's going to stop it. You know, mm -hmm. I'm like, yeah, that's right. That's what you got to do. Uh, so, look, just uh, I don't, I don't want to say it's, it's a mental, mental game, but it kind of is. And it's ridiculously it's important mental. from a mental standpoint that you believe in yourself and then others will believe in you. Yes. Totally. You know, um, speaking of believing in others, uh, I kind of want to shift gears for because unless anybody has anything else they want to add to college recruiting. So, you guys no, good? no, I think uh, I think we covered a lot. Okay. Yeah. 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 Um, 
I want to move on to somebody in the in the GK Union here in SoCal. We talked about it in the last podcast uh, in regards to Joe Velasco, Impact Goalkeeper Academy in the South Bay, uh, who's come on some health issues recently and has to take some time off from uh, from coaching. And uh, you know, big shout out to obviously you know Stan, you know, over at Camp Shutout and and everybody over there in regards to uh, creating this program, these uh, GK for Life, GK Union T-shirts to support Big Joe. Um, about a month ago, he was told he was out of commission for six months. Uh, so a bunch of different brands and goalkeeper coaches got together to help Joe out. He didn't ask for this again. Um, he probably wouldn't want us to do this if he had known that we were doing it, uh, but we decided to do it. Uh, 70 shirts have been sold already, so there aren't that many left. There's only small, medium, and large left. But if you are interested, all you got to do is $49 plus $5 shipping and handling uh, to Venmo at Mary Panderson and include your shipping address and your size. Or you can DM us here and go through your or so you can go through your goalkeeper coach. They probably know Big Joe, especially if you're in the Cal South area. And, uh, and, and we'll make sure that that money gets to him and that we get you uh, the T-shirts. Again, guys, even if you don't want the T-shirt, um, if you can donate back uh, – We've all been in situations before as as goalkeeper coaches or as goalkeeper professionals where being out of commission and you know you're going paycheck to paycheck and it makes it difficult you know so whatever we can do to help Joe he gives so much to the game uh, Mike knows this you know in the in the Southern California oh area yeah. um, you know that th this is the least we can do so um, yeah so uh, I guess we'll just keep it at that uh, yeah I hope you get well soon Joe yeah, yeah get well soon for yeah sure. and I know you're a listener too so you're an insider and uh, we appreciate you supporting and and honestly telling all your goalkeepers about us because uh, you know we've been getting some great comments back from them um, but I'll never learn how to use a rebounder like you do you, <laughs> you know how to use a rebounder better than anyone ever I know um, all right let's move on into the weekend goalkeeping and talking about another uh, big personality in the goalkeeping world Tim Howard uh, obviously, U.S. men's national team legend, Everton legend. Uh, spent some time, obviously, at Man U as well, too. Colorado Rapids. He had his final professional game at LAFC. I don't really want to delve into the scoreline because that's, yes, Carlos Vela won the golden boot, had a bunch of goals, yada, yada, yada. That's not what really matters. Uh, what means more is what did Tim Howard represent as a goalkeeper growing up in the United States to us, and that's what I really want to talk about uh, here right now. So with with – two other esteemed goalkeepers here. I kind of want to get their thoughts on what, what Timmy meant to you. Uh, who wants to start? I'll go. Um, All right. So for me, uh, growing up watching Tim Howard, I mean, he, I think, I feel like he was the one that made that jump where it made that dream to play for a Manchester United reachable. You know, he came up through the American system. Um, I know, you know, Casey Keller and, um, and Friedel had done the same thing, but for our generation, Tim Howard was the one the guy. that yeah, you saw him starting for Manchester United. Like, wow, that, that just it blew your mind. And then you saw him be successful and you saw him, you know, then go to Everton and be the guy for years. And you're just thinking, wow, he's he's iconic. I mean, Tim Howard will go down probably maybe this is a controversial statement, but probably is the best American goalkeeper in the last 20 years. So far, maybe. <laughs> Stefan, what's up, dude? <laughs> <laughs> is, that a, is that a shout out to Zach yeah, Stefan right there, man? <laughs> Two time kicker team of the week in the Bundesliga. Cool. Yeah, Big not time. to not to take anything away from Timmy, but I you know, obviously I think Stefan has that potential to be the best. Um and hopefully that's the case every every time there's kind of a change of guard that we think, man, this guy could be the best. And that's kinda of, that's part of the reason why we're doing what we're doing is uh is because we want we want that pride again, you know, that that pride of having a goal, a goalkeeper from the U.S. playing at Manchester United, playing at one of these massive clubs. Like that's part of the reason we're doing what we're doing is because we want to get the information into the hands of the kids who are going to make this happen. And so the more we can give you, hopefully the more you can translate that into, OK, I can do this. This is how I'm going to do it. I'm learning. I'm getting better. And yeah, continue to bridge that gap because that's so cool. I can't tell you how how awesome it was to watch Timmy do this like at Everton. I'd say the most that I watched him was probably when he was playing for Everton and he was just crushing it. It's <laughs> like, dude, this is this is why that's why that's one of the big reasons I chose to wear twenty four for so much of my uh my career is because I, I grew up watching Timmy and I, I was like, Man, this guy is awesome. Like He's just crushing it with Everton. Like, that's that's what I want to do. You know, that was always one of my goals. And 
unfortunately life didn't happen to you know that that didn't happen for me necessarily and uh and i was very fortunate to play in the mls but watching timmy do this was was so cool man and we we want that again we want we want zach stefan to get uh you know i know obviously he's with some uh with a with a great team now but you know, we want we want to see him with. Yeah, no slouch to Dusseldorf in, yeah. in any way whatsoever. I mean, you know, obviously, you know, it, it, any any team that's playing in the Bundesliga is, is a good level team. Totally. Uh, I mean, Timmy, 414 appearances for Everton, uh, 2009 FA Cup final, uh, where they only lost by one goal to a powerhouse Chelsea yeah. uh, squad at the time. Um, just 121 caps for the United States. Uh, wow. Arguably one of the greatest performances by a goalkeeper in <laughs> World Cup history. Absolutely. I mean, just I mean, the Secretary of Defense that they called it. <laughs> I mean, I still uh, to this day memes. remember that game. Yeah. I mean, just it was just unreal. Uh, so, so Timmy, everything you know from from the goalkeeper union on, you know, we all just want to thank you. You know, I I, want, I almost said thank you for your service, which I guess <laughs> kind of goes with the Secretary of Defense type of thing. But yeah. like. Uh, but it's true. I mean, thank you for your service. Thank you for showing us that you could go from Major League Soccer to the English Premier League. You know, yes, Brad Friedel played one year in the MLS before he went over to Europe. But you were really the Guzan. first one. Yeah. yeah. I mean, Guzan, obviously, too, is, is well played in MLS. But you were really the first one, you know. I mean, th this was a league that at the chance time might have even folded. And you were playing for Metro Stars, and, and, and you were given a shot to, to get to the world stage. And that, that just, as an American goalkeeper, you know, I, it just made me say, oh, my gosh, they're looking, yeah. you know. Yeah. And, and I said, what do I need to do? And they're like, have you looked at your genes? And <laughs> your genes don't say that you can play in the English Premier League. Uh, no. Um, shout out to Timmy. All right, let's move on to uh, the staying in the EPL. Uh, Hugo Lloris, uh, he's out, wrist injury. Yeah. Um, Spurs have been on a downward spiral, obviously. The Brighton loss this weekend. 3-0. I don't want to talk too much about that. I don't want to talk too much about Larissa's injury or what happened in the game in regards to, to, to the goal errors um, because he's out until 2020, which means Oof. that now Paolo Gazana Gazaniga, Gaza, as I like to call him, um, <laughs> Gaza's easier. is going to yeah. be the number <laughs> Yeah, he'll be the number one for Spurs now. And uh, I want to really break down Gazaniga for a lot of you guys who are not familiar with Gazaniga. Um, I'm a I'm a fan of Paolo Gazaniga. I think he's got a huge upside. Um who here? Who here wants to start? Mike, you want to talk about uh, Gaza a little sure, bit? Sure. Um, you know, he's he's at the right age. You know, twenty seven. I think twenty seven years old. He's got some some games in him where he's played well. You know, in the Argentine national team. You know, he's right on the cusp of maybe being that guy. Uh, but being at the level uh, with Spurs and in the EPL day in and day out, you know, he's really going to get that opportunity to elevate himself to that next level. And he's got all the physical capabilities. Um, I think the next thing for him is just that consistency of being, you know, in that pressure cooker of the EPL, you know, every week, especially for a team like Spurs, like you said, or up and down right now, you know, uh, can he be the guy that comes in and kind of steers that ship back onto course? And I mean, you guys have seen it before. A goalkeeper can change seasons for teams and especially a guy who's right at that age, you know, he's, he's going to be a, a very good, a good guy to watch for the next few weeks. Yeah, I you know one thing I think that's really good for him is the fact that you know Pochettino knew him from Southampton, so mm -hmm. that they've got that familiarity. He obviously got some time with with Spurs last year. Um, you know, I think he knows the team pretty well. Um, my only concern about him and, and Patrick, I want to talk about this because we had mentioned this earlier in regards to he's in that six five going to six six type of size, and we talk about the sweet spot. And is it that six three six four spot for a goalkeeper? Once you start getting a little bit past six four, now you start having some issues, maybe physically, in regards to your movement. Um, is the is there a too big in your opinion? Um, I mean, there is definitely too big <laughs> in this in this scenario, but I don't think Gaza uh, fits into that because he's so quick, like he's ridiculously quick for his size, and his center of gravity and the way he plays is is smaller it falls into that that like sweet spot and the more i watch this guy the more i'm impressed with him and there, i can't say that for a lot of goalkeepers because <laughs> i think there's a lot of goalkeepers that um you know they have their strengths and they do their strengths but this guy is just really quality all around and i mean just he's able to react to the to, lo to the low stuff which is what you kind of worry about in a tall goalkeeper 
I mean, he's just, I, I think, I think big things are going to come from this guy. I mean, he's right. He's right in that age range. Like Mike was saying, 27, like he's just starting to roll into the prime of his career. I think, I think this guy's going to become a mainstay and shout out to Spurs for having such a, such a stable of goalkeepers. Like what about shout out to Southampton, another diamond that I they know. produced. Oh my gosh. I mean, you know, yeah. that Are you guys an Angus, Angus Gunn fan? You an Angus Gunn fan? Of course. Well, how yeah. can you not be? But yeah, I mean, yeah. like Southampton, they seem to just find these young men that eventually end up being superstars. Yeah. It's crazy. It's, it's, un, it's unreal what, the, what they're doing over there. Um, one thing I want to bring up about Gaza and I want a lot of young kids out there to say is that despite if let's just say if he was a little bit a step slower or whatever, um, his angle play is so solid that he makes up for his deficiencies. Um, you know, one one thing is I always say is that if you read the game very well, you can make up for any sort of athletic deficiency, whether it's your – obviously his size is not an issue with him, but whether it's foot speed, uh, whether it's – you know, one thing that he has is that, that issue of getting top-heavy sometimes uh, when you're a taller goalkeeper because they got to drop into that starting position shape, and because of that they can kind of get caught in that shoulder gap type of thing. But his angle plays so solid that it makes up for it because totally. he's so in position, you know. Yeah, so let's let's move over into the Bundesliga now, and I want to talk about another prospect here because this is amazing to me. David Wagner has made Alexander Nubel – uh, at 22 or 23, I think he's 23 now, uh, he gave him the captain's armband uh, at the beginning of the season uh, for a really solid Schalke team that, that honestly looks like they could be a Champions League team next year, uh, the way that they're playing. Um, unfortunately, they didn't get the three points this, this weekend. Uh, Cologne got that late equalizer. Um, but to put that kind of responsibility on a young goalkeeper like, like, like Nubel, um, and also Schalke always producing high-level goalkeepers. Yeah. It's, it's amazing. Yeah. Um, what do we think is the ceiling for Nubel? And also, let's talk about giving a young goalkeeper the captain's armband. What does that mean? As being someone who has played for professional teams and been in this environment, like to give an armband to what is essentially in that locker room a kid, is that's, that's a statement. That's this guy, from what we see, is going to be the national team guy within the next couple years at least. I mean... It, He's an impressive kid. He must have very impressive character to uh, to win the captain's armband like this. Yeah, Mike, have you ever seen anything like this before? Try. I was. It's, it's funny. I was just thinking that I was trying to think of maybe uh, Buffon or something. Maybe like that. it's yeah. a, he's going the Manuel Neuer route. You yeah. know, he's coming from Schalke, being the captain. You know, uh, maybe it's the German Federation or. But shout out to David Wagner. I mean, yeah. an American coach. You know, having the. That's right. I guess basically having the you know, the stones to make that young of a person the, the captain and be successful at it, too. Also, as a first-year coach yeah. at that club, um, you know, coming from a Huddersfield team that was relegated in the EPL, <laughs> you know, showing that it wasn't his fault. Yeah. Um, you know, it, it, I'm just, I'm excited. That's such a yarn young team, too. Right? I mean, you know, you, you, but, I mean, they got some cool, really good players on that on that team that I'm excited about. I mean, obviously, Weston McKinney, you know, we're very excited about as, as Americans there. Um my only concern about Nubel is that sometimes he lets his emotions get the best of him. And again, he's 23 years old. Yeah, it's going to happen with a kid um, that it, age. It's, <laughs> yeah. it's going to happen. I mean, you think you think of it in this in this regard. What are most 23 year olds who are pursuing um, professional soccer doing right now? They're they're probably in the process of making that transition into their first professional into their first pr professional team. And this guy is winning captain's armbands at that. I mean, that's, I mean, this kid's obviously got a very bright future for him. Well, I mean, obviously he's still, he's still young. I think the one thing that he's got going for him is he's got world-class reflexes. Totally. Um, he fits in, in, the, in that, that sweet spot, that 6-4 range. Um, he plays it. he's one of these goalkeepers that plays a really deep position. He's a reactionary goalkeeper rather than um, a, uh, an anticipatory goalkeeper. And I think it's because he's so good with his reflexes. Yeah. So he plays a deep position uh, to be ready for that header um, rather than coming out. It's one thing at, at 6'4", you would think he'd be a little bit more aggressive coming off his line in that, in that regard. Um, but he understands you know, where, where he's beneficial. If there's one thing that I would say from a negative standpoint, and again, I'm nitpicking here, is he has a tendency to spill in rough spots rather than good steers. And again, he's still young, and I've never played in the Bundesliga. I don't know what it's like with those <laughs> shots coming at me like that. Um, but because of that, he can get a little re reckless on, on these balls, um, trying to, you know, kind of recover. And, uh, and, and if sometimes if he just speared the ball in the right spot, he wouldn't have to deal with that as much. 
Yeah, I'd like to comment on just uh, him not coming out at six four. Like as as a as a bigger goalkeeper, you know, I, I I try to play more aggressively, sometimes to my detriment. And that being said, like the abilities of these players to whip in like unbelievable balls these days uh, is just ridiculous. They're hitting this thing just above head level, and they're and they're dropping it right in the right spots so a lot of the time they're they're asking for you to come out and make a mistake in these situations and i think that <laughs> that new Bull's way of playing these balls is is correct for the game where it is today and i'm not saying hey goalkeepers don't go out for crosses because it's very important that i you want every u9 <laughs> out there to yeah. never go out for a cross <laughs> but i mean it's it's also understanding his own his own quality uh, as it comes to to his reflexes. I mean, it's it's so important that you know what you're good at and you don't <laughs> – I mean, if you're playing for the Bundesliga, it's a little different than if you're trying <laughs> to develop as a youth ke keeper because I would highly suggest always trying to find your range as a youth keeper. But as Nubel, like, he's obviously got a very good understanding of, of his range and where he's at and where he's going to be the most effective – as it as it relates to the play. Yeah, and I think we're going to see him in the in the next you know couple of years if he if he doesn't move on to another league because his contract is up at the end of the season and he could could leave on a free um, is is to be one of the top goalkeepers. I mean, I think right now you know I'd say Petr Kaleshi at over at, at Red Bull Leipzig might be one of the keepers of the year. I think uh, Yuri Pavlenka over at Bremen has been doing a very good job. Uh, obviously Zach Steffen, you know we got a soft spot <laughs> for him. Uh, I don't want his ego to get too big, so I'm not going to say he's the top <laughs> keeper in the Bundesliga just yet. Uh, but there's there's some good ones there. So, you know, um, I, I love watching the Bundesliga. I think it's a, 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 a very fast league, and it's exciting to watch. And I, I think a lot of young goalkeepers, you guys could benefit from watching. Yeah. Don't just watch the EPL. There's, there's a lot of other great leagues out there. Yeah. You know? um, so speaking of other leagues, let's talk about a league that doesn't get a lot of shine uh, from anybody. USL League One. <laughs> and for those of you guys who are not familiar what USL League One is, it is the second division of USL right underneath the championship, uh, otherwise known as the third division professionally here in the United States. Um, so there's a lot of teams that were in USL championship last year. Uh, they decided to move and create this USL League One along with some expansion teams to give another outlet for developing uh, players to, to be able to start their professional careers. And some guys have really used this to their advantage. Uh, there's a guy named Dallas Jay who had been bouncing around USL Championship for years uh, trying, trying to get a shot. And uh, this year he ended up going to Greenville, uh, ended up winning the starting job, and uh, was just named the Golden Glove uh, in League One USL. Uh, so shout out to Dallas yeah. Jay, uh, who I think is an insider as well too. I think he follows us. Um, I, I, that's a cr phenomenal accomplishment. And obviously, you know, I, I've known about Dallas, you know, for years from his youth level over in San Ramon and Danville area and, and where he's come from, you know, really pushing himself as a youth keeper and, and trying to become he's – a, he's a guy that mindset, you know, everyone kept telling him no, and he kept pushing and pushing and pushing until eventually he got to the, uh, the professional level. Um, he had a .78 goals against average, obviously a very good Greenville team. Um, but 13 clean sheets, uh, that's, that's no small fat feat. Um, Mike, did you ever see Dallas, you know, in the recruiting process or anything? Um, I unfortunately didn't get to see him. I saw his brother play, who was a field player, and I got to know uh, his family a little bit. You know, great family. Um, but I did get to see him play at uh, FC Cincinnati. Uh, a friend of mine is the GM there. And so I followed them pretty closely when before they made the jump to the MLS. And uh, he was playing out of his mind when they uh, before they made that jump. And, you know, I've the name just keeps popping up when you follow all the leagues in the country and, you know, watching his highlights and I've seen him play a few times, you know, like you said, someone who just does all the things right to help you win games, yeah. you know, and I think that's the most important thing for the young goalkeepers is when you watch a guy like this, he's doing what it takes to win you games. You know, he's not just kind of sitting back. He's making those game changing saves where you're thinking, oh, this guy's in, it's a goal. And he sticks that foot out or he gets that hand out. And all of a sudden it's still zero, zero. You know, what, one thing about Dallas and, and, you know, Patrick and I, we were talking about discipline and being a disciplined goalkeeper. And because Dallas, for those of you guys who are unfamiliar with Dallas, he's listed at six foot. 
<laughs> so genuine, yeah, or ge- generous. This is generous, generous <laughs> six foot. Uh, so he doesn't have the greatest size, but he makes up for it with good shape and starting position. How many goalkeepers have you seen at the professional level who've made up for their physical detriments by just being in the right place at the right time? You know, I'd say the biggest one is obviously uh, here in the States is Nick Romando. Um, I mean, his ability to read the game and his distribution is just unparalleled. It's unparalleled in, in the MLS. His reactions, like he's he's obviously fantastic. And I mean, you really, you really, 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 really need to be disciplined if you're undersized, quote, undersized, because you, you don't have that same kind of gray area of, oh, well, yeah, I can kind of get away with, no, you can't. I mean, <laughs> you can't get away with anything. Like John Bush is a perfect example of an undersized goalkeeper who's, I call them controllables. It's everything that you can control in a game. If you're doing that well, you're probably a really great goalkeeper. And that's one thing that I can say about John Bush is like his controllables are out of control. <laughs> no, <laughs> are out of this world. And, uh, and, and Nikki's the same way. And it's just, I mean, that's, that's the best way to offset um, a size is to, to understand that there's no, there's no room for error for you and to, to really push with that in mind. Yeah. And by the way, guys, if anyone you're wondering why, hey, Nikki, you know, just played his, his last regular season game too. Well, Nikki made the playoffs. So, um, you know, we're, we're going to hold off on, on, on boasting about Nikki until his, until his career is finally over. Hopefully RSL has a nice solid run in the playoffs right there. And then maybe we'll even have him do it, uh, you, know, you know, live here, you know, when he comes out here yeah. uh, to SoCal, you know, Ooh. during winter break and stuff like that. Yeah, um, you know, to really, really get a, a good feeling for it. So shout out to you, Nikki. You know, we're, we're rooting for you in, against, uh, I think they're playing, what, the Seattle? Is that they're playing Seattle uh, in the first round? I don't know. MLS is confusing. <laughs> um, all right, let's, uh, let's move on uh, real quickly to uh, decision day. Um, not a lot of great moments for goalkeepers that, that day. A, a lot of the races seemed kind of to kind of figure themselves out real quickly. Dallas, what was it, 6-0 yeah. against Sporting? I, oh, man, I, felt, I really felt bad for Eric Dick there because yeah. I think he's got good upside at Sporting KC, and I know we'd, we'd spoken to the, the goalkeeper coaches over there, and they're, they're very high on him. Uh, I think he was a Creighton product or something like that, but um, he, he's got a good future there. Uh, I want to talk about Eloy Room, who I'm a big fan of. You know, um, Obviously, Curacao uh, used to be the backup at PSV, and he's now the number one for Columbus Crew, filling in for Zach Steffen, who obviously left for Europe. Um, he made number one on Sports Center. That rarely happens for an MLS goalkeeper, and I want to tell you guys why. I want to break down this play. In the 36th minute, um, Josie Altidore uh, gets a ball from Marco Delgado. I think it's a, it, it's a very simple square ball across, but it finds that separation for Josie. Eloy Room is in a deep, not deep position, he's actually in a higher position. He makes the save, and he steers it into a position where his recovery movement covers the gap because Michael Bradley is coming in on that ball, and he makes that save. Uh, in the bottom left corner. Um, how impressed are you guys by, by Eloy and what he's been able to do in MLS so far? I mean, for me, it was watching him um, for Curacao. And I, t- you know, to be honest, it did, had no idea who he was. And I thought, man, this guy's world class and he's playing for such a small country. And then when the crew picked him up, I thought, hey, that's a great pickup. And he's been steadfast for them. I mean, if you have to replace a guy like Zach Steffen, you have all the pressure on you, all the eyes on you, and he has been lights out for them. So, you know, congratulations to Eloy Room, man. He's, he's really doing a, a great job. Yeah. Uh, Patrick, do you want to kind of break down why it's so important when you steer that ball like that, that uh, that recovery step comes forward in front of the post? Comes forward in front of the post. What do you mean? Well, as in, so the ball is spilled. So he Josie Altidore hits yeah. that shot. The ball is spilled across, and right. for those of you guys who are seeing me on, on camera here, and he immediately after he makes the steer, his first step is forward. It's a crossover step across body so that he closes the gap initially for Bradley, who's coming onto that ball, before he even has really time to get up to a full, sh- right. full shape. Well, the biggest thing is, and after <laughs> you, know, you know exactly the sort of footwork that you're going to need for a moment like this if you're Eli Room because he's done it so many times. And he knows the second that this comes off his hand, okay, 
I'm, I'm immediately going to be under pressure because I did not parry this far enough away from the goal. I didn't, I didn't put it out of bounds. Like I am going to need to make a second save. And so when he takes that, that first step across his body, that's allowing him the ability to push from there. So if he has to, he can push directly from there and close that distance, which he does. And he does brilliantly like making that double save on Michael Bradley. Michael Bradley's a great player. Like he's, you know, this is this is a great play and and shout out to him for making sports center that's that's rad yeah yeah i uh i think the one thing that i always want to stress to to younger goalkeepers and and i don't want to talk too much about this save because i i think you guys need to see the video yourselves and, and go out there and, and check out the mls highlight from this past sunday and, and you'll see what we're talking about but is that if that step is somehow negative um or even static Michael Bradley slips that into yep. the near post. Yeah, there's such a small margin for error in this play. And you don't think about it, and he's certainly not thinking about it. He's just thinking about what he needs to do next. And, and, that's, and that's why he's able to make that save is because he's not thinking about, oh, I need to put my feet. Oh, Michael Bradley just scored. Uh, <laughs> He's, he's done it enough that he knows exactly that step, and it just, it just comes as second nature. He's not thinking about his step. He's thinking, I need to close that space, and that's exactly what that first step does. Yeah, and uh, I'd rather you're more aggressive coming off and closing that gap than being passive. Totally. Yeah, you know, as yeah. always goalkeeper. be aggressive. Yeah, yeah, especially the closer you get to that, the harder it's going to be for yeah. him because now he's, got it, he's thinking about, oh, well, I – is this guy going to hit me? He's thinking about that. The more the more doubt that you can place into the head of a striker or an attacking player is going to benefit you exponentially. <laughs> Mike, how many times when you're scouting a youth keeper do you see them just say, okay, well, I did my job, and then they forget about that second ball? Yeah, I mean, uh, as a youth player, you know, sometimes things are going to happen that you're not planning. Like you make a big-time first save, and some will just get up and say, hey, where's my defenders? You know, it doesn't matter where your defenders are. You have to get up and you have to sacrifice, you know, your body to get in front of that ball to save the game. And in that game, you know, Quentin Westberg also made a, a very awesome save in that and top corner. shout out Quentin Westberg, yeah. take, really Big taking time. the reins Dude. of that number one job in Toronto. Right. Yeah, I had no idea how that was all going to play out, but all right. Yeah, <laughs> so he made, a, he made a fine save as well to keep his team in the match. So, you know goalkeepers that are really willing to put their body on the line to make those saves are going to find themselves jobs all the time. Speaking of guys that find jobs from putting everything on the line, <laughs> let's finish off the episode with Victor Valdez, everyone's favorite former Barcelona goalkeeper uh, who spent some time. Didn't he, he play? Where else did he play? Didn't he play in the championship for a little bit or he something like that? He was at like Middlesbrough, that? right? Yeah, he was at Middlesbrough, right? <laughs> yeah. He was at Middle didn't he spend some time at Fenerbahce or something? Yeah. He, 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 he had a little bit of time after, after Barcelona. Uh, one of the products of uh, La, La, La Masia. Um, he was the U19 co coach over at uh, Barcelona, and uh, it, it has not worked out for him. He's no longer the U19 coach at Barcelona, which is amazing considering he came up through that youth system. Um, I want to kind of finish off this episode because a lot of people reach out to me and they say, you know, why aren't you a team coach? Why do you just keep doing goalkeepers your whole life? Did you ever want to be a team coach? Um, why do some goalkeeper coaches just try to become managers? Why do some not choose to be managers? Uh, what are our final thoughts on goalkeepers in managerial positions? And is there a, a negative stigma to it? Oh man, you know, th absolutely there is. Yeah. You know, I will say I I've coached uh, um, teams myself, and when you tell them that you used to play goalkeeper, they'll look at you like, well, you don't know what you're doing. Then immediately off the off the bat, <laughs> they're like, uh, they're like, can the captain be the coach? Yeah. <laughs> so yes, there's a negative stigma, um, but that does not mean that you don't know what you're doing. Uh, unfortunately, I think it gets publicized and glamorized the failures of former goalkeepers that don't do well um, in the in the the big man role, but uh, you know the thing about a goalkeeper is you get to see the field as things develop. So I think you do have a very good understanding. Um, you know, it's just kind of w personality. I think you know sometimes field players that transition into managerial roles have more of that understanding of the g ebbs and flows of the game, and they're able to communicate with field players maybe better. I'm not saying they can or can't, but maybe um, as goalkeepers, you know, we demand a lot from our team. And sometimes as a manager, demanding that from your team 
might not be the best way to go about it. So, you know, it's it's kind of hit and miss, I think. Yeah. Yeah, it's demand versus um, <laughs> encourage, I think. Uh, <laughs> That's a good way to put it. Yeah. Uh, you know, I I have to I have to side with Mike on this because you see it a lot when considering captains as well. And you know, I've talked to GMs about this before. It's like you kind of want a, a player or a captain or a coach to be able to relate to the 10 guys as opposed to the one guy. And that's one of the, one of the biggest things, one of the biggest hurdles that you're always going to face is as a, as a goalkeeper in this head coach job is you're always going to have an easier time relating, identifying <laughs> and understanding the goalkeeper position more so than the field player position. And while we do spend a lot of time watching the game, and I think that is very important. I think there are definitely aspects of the game that are just understood better by the field players. Yeah, I, I mean, I'll, I'll straight up say this just in regards to me. Like, I don't want to coach a number six because <laughs> I've never played that position. I don't know what it's like. I also don't like tackling. I think tackling, <laughs> I'm not a fan of that. That looks hard and it looks uncomfortable. Yeah. Um, I'd rather go in with my hands or uh, – or foot save, reckless foot save. Uh, I like doing that one too. Well, well, that's one of the reasons we do this, right? Is because because the mentality, because the frame of mind is so much different than the other players on the field. Like it, it's it's always going to be an uphill battle, and some guys are successful at it, and that's awesome and good on them, because I'm sure they've studied a lot, they've watched a lot, they understand what it takes to be that guy. Um, but ultimately, like, we are a different sort of species when it comes to the game. Yeah, and, you know, and uh, I mean, obviously, shout out New England. You know, you Brad Friedel, you hired him as, as the manager, and then obviously it didn't unfortunately work out. You guys decided to go a different direction and brought Bruce Arena in, and, uh, you know, that's obviously been successful for, for New England. So, you know, th you know, hey, you can't fault them for, for that, obviously, the experience level there. Um, but at least given given Brad a shot because I know Brad wants to be a manager. Yeah. I know that's that's one of the things. But look at also the situation here is like uh, look at Jesse Marsh, you know, at Salzburg. You know, if he hadn't come through the Red Bull system, would he be getting a shot I in Champions League? You know, uh, managing a club, all just a simple matter of just because like he he played in MLS. Yeah. You know, I so mean the thing for me about um, goalkeepers and transitioning into that head coach role is. The field players will always see you as a goalkeeper, unfortunately or fortunately, and it's up to you to almost win their trust. Yeah. And with time being a factor in seasons, you don't have that time to win their trust. You know, if you bring in, say, like an Iniesta, and he's going to be your head coach, there is immediate respect there. You know, and he's going to be able to shape the team in the way he wants it. You know, as a goalkeeper coach, we spend so much time perfecting our craft. Um, it's hard to kind of get into those other aspects of the f of the. I, I learned from other coaches, even at the college level. You know, our uh, head and assistant coach, they'll bring things to the table. I'm like, man, that's really good. You know, I wouldn't have thought of that. And then vice versa, I'll tell them things about goalkeepers, and they're like, wow, we never thought of that either. <laughs> so it's a it's a great experience to have a staff that will you know listen to each other and bring new ideas to the table. But you know, unfortunately for goalkeeper coaches, I think that we don't have the best track history as head coaches. When you look at Brad Friedel, I mean, Jeff Kassar, you know, he was recently fired. Um, I can't think of anybody else in the MLS <laughs> that used to be a, a head coach that was a goalkeeper. I mean, and look, I mean, Valdez, you're talking about a guy who won Champions League. Oh, yeah. yeah. You yeah. know, and, and, and not cutting at the U19 level, you know. I mean, that 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 just says right there that it, it's, a, it's a very difficult hill to climb. But just like anything in life, if you really want it... It's doable. It's doable. I, I mean, look, nobody said Bob Bradley could coach in the English Premier League, and he did, you know? Regardless of what happened in that situation, he did coach in the English Premier League. So, so anything's possible out there. Um, all right, guys, we've been going for like almost an hour and a half, so I want to thank everybody who's been listening on Facebook Live on the live stream. Uh, you guys are amazing. Uh, you guys are the hardcore fans. Uh, the podcast is going to be out momentarily, uh, probably be out in the next day or 
or so. Uh, another shout out to Mike Osagara for for coming on, making that five minute commute <laughs> over here. Uh, <laughs> honestly, dude, we'll have to have you back, dude, because uh, this is this has been great. Um, remember, guys, contact at inside the eighteen media dot com if you've got guest suggestions or if you've got listener question. Uh, keep rating and reviewing, and subscribing those reviews on our platforms all over the world. Let's get to seven hundred thousand by next week. Uh, no, let's just get to a hundred <laughs> in the U.S. How about that? And you'll get that inside the eighteen scarf. Uh, that's all the time we got on Inside the 18. We're out. Later, guys. See you guys. Thank you. All right. All right.